Uh, yeah, everyone can hear me fine? Yep, okay, cool, awesome. Uh, I'm Ariel Walden. I'm a digital anthropologist from San Francisco. Um, I'm sure most of you aren't familiar with me, but that's cool, I'm enjoying my time in Wellington. Um, so I like to start off my presentations uh, with this slide. It's from Voyager 1, a spacecraft that's going to the outer reaches of the solar system. Um, and it's taken a photo uh, from four billion miles away from Earth. And that tiny little pale blue speck of a dot right there that you can see, that's Earth from four billion miles away. So that's exactly where you can find me if you need me. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I'm here to talk about hacking into space exploration and all the cool open source stuff that surrounds it. Um, so how many of you are familiar with this image? Wow, a lot of you, awesome. <laughs> My mother uh, wasn't familiar with it, so I thought it might be a younger generation thing. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, this is an image taken by the Hubble telescope of, of the Eagle Nebula. Um, and it's an image that's become fairly familiar in our, uh, our society and our culture. Um, similarly, how many of you are familiar with this image? A lot of you again, awesome, space nerds. Um, <laughs> I'm a complete space geek, uh, if you couldn't figure that out. Um, <laughs> um, so this is an image taken from Apollo. Uh, and again, this is, these are images that have really become integrated into our culture, and we're fairly familiar with them. Um, and they're, uh, you know, we're fairly familiar with them, however, we haven't really tinkered with them. We don't really know the data behind them. We, don't, we aren't really able to interact with them. So they've become something that's more uh, based on observation and familiarity rather than actually being able to hack into it. So to kind of go over the history of how we got to where that is today, in 1969, we sent a man to the moon. Fairly historical event. Also in 1969, we uh, sent the first message over ARPANET. The message was LO, which stood for login, and the computer crashed supposedly shortly after sending it. Um, despite that, uh, even though putting a man on the moon was fairly historical, with 40 years of hindsight, which one of these events has had a greater impact? Well, today, you know, there's over a billion internet users and uh, LAN parties, as this one seen here, um, and, and it's multiplying day by day. But with 50 years of space exploration behind us, only about 500 people have actually been in space. This is a fact I find kind of sad um, and not really acceptable. So I'm here to talk about hacking into space exploration and where it stands now, all the different ways that you can actually contribute to space exploration. Um, and so like the Tron guy who wants Tron to become a reality now, we want space to become a reality now. And we want it on a fast schedule. We want it cheap and fast and we want it to be reality. Um, and so as a lot of you are familiar with uh, hacking and hacktivism, uh, being able to actually do something changes the way you see it. So being able to actually contribute to science, being able to actually get involved in something changes the way you see it. So it moves you further away from the whole observation uh, standpoint that we have with NASA and various other space agencies. To quote the Maker's Bill of Rights, if you can't open it, you don't own it. So this applies to open hardware, open software, all these different ways that you can actually uh, do things with them and make it your own. But the important part of space exploration is that it's not just about open hardware and open software. It's also about open collaboration. Because while open hardware and open software are really cool, they still require a learning curve in order to participate. So open collaboration is really about embracing different backgrounds and a variety of different uh, skill sets in order to uh, kind of push space exploration forward. So when we look at NASA and all the images that we've become familiar with, uh, the European Space Agency, et cetera, um, while they're doing a lot of disrupting sound barriers, they're not doing much to disrupt openness. They're not actually that open. But it didn't used to always be this way. Um, a lot of the uh, scientific heroes that we would, uh, that we kind of look up to today would be actually considered amateurs by today's standards. Charles Darwin, who created the theory of evolution, was primarily self-funded. He didn't get a lot of funding from other sources, so it was primarily through himself. Thomas Edison, uh, also, uh, who created the light bulb, was primarily uneducated. He was homeschooled, and a lot of the experiments that he ended up uh, doing before he became famous were done during his night job, during his second shift. 
Uh, there's also other instances like the Harvard computers. How many of you are familiar with them? Some women, for sure, and some people. Okay, so the Harvard computers uh, was a group of women who were hired by an astronomer um, to classify different types of stars. Uh, some were educated, but a lot of them were just maids and uneducated women who were hired to do this. However, together, through collaboration, uh, they were able to create the star, classification, star classification systems that we use today. So how far away a star is, how hot it is, et cetera. And also, they had the really awesome ability of having their job title be an actual computer, uh, <laughs> which uh, is, I don't know, I think pretty cool. Um, so how did we get to this standpoint? Um, is that, no, this is a, a, a illustration from Five Fists of Science, a uh, sort of sci-fi comic book that uh, has scientists fighting each other. And Mark Twain, I think, is like a bad guy. Um, <laughs> um, so how did we get to the standpoint where science is this really elitist thing today? Well, there's a lot of reasons. But in the 1950s, one of them is the fact that as astronomy and other new emerging sciences began, um, a lot of what would happen is different scientists would fight over whose department uh, should it take over. So chemists would fight with geologists over whose approach to astronomy and other types of sciences was considered amateurish and whose was considered more professional. Fast forward to today, um, a lot of those standards have created this elitist place that we live in today where some people are considered scientists and others are considered amateurs. That combined with the fact that a lot of the technologies that have emerged over the last century are extremely expensive. So unless you are actually working for a government agency or under a university, you most likely won't be able to afford the technologies you, meet, you need to uh, make accurate measurements. Um, so if you don't have access to a government agency or university, most likely you're considered an amateur. Need some water. So going to um, about a year ago, uh, Jane McGonigal, a uh, fairly well-known game designer, uh, went to Webstock in New Zealand about a year ago. And I was helping her in San Francisco. And we, we ran a forecasting game um, to, for, to get people's different forecasts on what will you do when space is as cheap and as accessible as the web is today. So what will you do when satellites become more accessible, similar to an iPod? So while well, people had good forecasts and people had bad forecasts about how it would affect our society, the largest pattern we saw that was that it would create a citizen science renaissance. Um, and so this is a survey that I really like to go over, even though graphs are kind of boring. Um, this is a survey taken by Galaxy Zoo, a citizen science project that I'll be going over in a moment. Um, and this was taken over 11,000 people. And it asked people who were participating in citizen science um, what is the most related scientific activity that you participate in, in addition to doing citizen science? Over 80% of the people who answered this survey said that the most related scientific thing that they were doing was just watching cool robots and rockets on TV, watching the Discovery Channel, watching the History Channel, watching all this really cool stuff, and that's it. These aren't people participating in citizen science who really wanted to go for the astronomy degree and just didn't, and you know, now they're doing citizen science. These are people who are just watching TV and think it's really cool. Um, so this is fairly personal to me, because I was watching a program on the Discovery Channel about in 2008 uh, about the Apollo missions. And I got inspired to work at NASA. <laughs> I have no formal science background at all. Um, serendipitously, somehow, I did get a job at NASA. So I worked at NASA in 2008. It was fairly cool. I got to learn about dark matter. And, touch robots and satellites and a bunch of cool stuff. Um, but one of the most important things I actually learned at NASA was that I actually didn't need to work at NASA at all. I didn't need to be an astronaut. I didn't need to uh, have a formal science education. I didn't need any of that to actually contribute to science. In fact, when you work at NASA, you quickly learn that, uh, that you have so many restrictions that you can actually do a lot more if you don't work at NASA. Go figure. Um, so. A lot of people are awakening to this fact that space should be accessible to all. But it goes, space hacking goes one step beyond uh, <laughs> instructables. So <laughs> this is uh, instructables, how to make a paper spaceship. So space hacking goes beyond just being able to like build your own jetpack and like do it just to, in your own backyard just to see if you could do it. 
Um, and it goes one step beyond making super shiny face likings, while I'm sure very fashionable, not very functional. Um, and it goes beyond being a hipster wearing a shirt saying, this was supposed to be the future, where is my jetpack? It's not about whining about it. It's about saying, you know what? I don't want to take a rocket to the moon. I want to build a fucking space elevator to the moon. <laughs> and I want to see if it's able to be done by the end of this year. And that's what projects like Elevator 2010 are doing, trying to see if you can build a fucking space elevator to the moon. Um, so to recap, it's not about just getting excited and making things. It's about getting excited and making disruptively accessible things things that disrupt the current state of science and its elitism and make it accessible to everyone. And so, as I'm sure some of you have seen, Virgin Galactic and other space tourism sort of uh, commercial entities are, uh, are being able to send people to space, but it's for about $200,000 a pop, not that accessible. And who wants to be a space tourist anyway? We all want to be this guy. We want to be the local. We use apps like Foursquare and Doppler and all these different apps in order to make us feel like a local, like we can go somewhere and we know our way around. So we all want to be this guy, or at least some of us. Um, so this takes us to our modes of invading space. Uh, I'm going to be going through uh, robots, galaxies, satellites, open source, and data, all on a very casual schedule. Um, <laughs> so, okay, maybe we can't land on the moon ourselves right now. Maybe that's not possible. But we can build a robot and send it there for us. And that's what competitions like Google Lunar X Prize are doing. It's a $30 million competition sponsored by Google, open internationally, to build a robot and send it to the moon and have it transmit data back and a bunch of other cool stuff. And uh, as the X Prize founder, CEO, uh, said, it has been many decades since we explored the moon from the lunar surface. And it could be another six to eight years before any government returns. Even then, it will be at a large expense and probably with little public involvement. So Google Lunar X Prize is really dedicated to doing space on a faster and cheaper schedule. And a lot of teams, uh, this uh, picture here is one of the teams uh, that I met with in Germany, um, are taking this to heart and want to be the cheapest team. So it's not just about winning the prize, it's about actually being able to push technology forward. So Google Lunar X Prize is a pretty cool competition in that uh, people are building a lot of different experimental ways to explore the lunar surface. Uh, this is Team Celine, a, a team out of China. They, uh, this is their prototype for a rocket sled. Um, I'm sure it would be fairly fun to ride on. Um, there's other teams. Uh, this is from a team in Romania, uh, some spherical like ball thing. I actually have no idea how it works, but it looks kind of cool. Um, other teams, uh, this is a team from the States, they have a more modular approach. Other teams, uh, this is astrobotic teams, uh, have a solar-based approach. But if you don't know much about robotics, have no fears. Team Fredna is the completely open source team for the Google Lunar X Prize, and they're open source about everything, including open collaboration. So if you don't know much about robotics, but you think it's really cool and you want to get involved, they need help from everyone. So they need help from designers, PR people, any sort of skill set. They need your help to actually send this robot to the moon. So it's not just about robotics. And uh, what you're looking at here is a, a photo of the uh, Pico rover that they have, which is pretty cool to watch in action. If you're not the competitive type, again, there's other options for you. Uh, Open Luna Foundation and a new organization I heard about the other day called Sea Start are doing very similar things. They want to send robots to the moon, and even eventually people. Um, and it's not competition, so it's just these foundations. Um, but in order to do this, they need help from everyone. So right now, a lot of their stuff is still based on paper. But in, so they need help from everyone to sort of push them to make more physical prototypes. So if you think <laughs> robots are actually kind of dumb, they actually are kind of dumb. Robots are really dumb. <laughs> There's a lot of things that humans can do that robots can't, um, like identify unique things um, and you know, just be a lot more awesome, I guess. Um, and so with that insight in mind, Galaxy Zoo is a thing on the web where you can go to Galaxy Zoo and start classifying galaxies that have never been uh, seen before, potentially, by another human eye. Um, so you can identify and classify new galaxies 
and you might even be able to discover completely not found before galaxies. So how Galaxy Zoo got started was a student in the UK was tasked with classifying 50,000 galaxies on his own. Um, to give you an idea, this picture has about 10,000 galaxies. So imagine that times five, and you need to analyze each individual pixel. Needless today to say, excuse me, um, he got really sick of it. <laughs> he was like, isn't there a better way to do this? Um, and that's what a lot of other people are realizing too. There's a lot of unprocessed interstellar stuff out there. Um, because as technology grows, we need to be able to analyze things on a human level, um, yet we're able to capture more and more. So in the 1950s, uh, we were using photoplates and only captured about 1,000 galaxies on the Palomar. In the 1980s, we switched over to film, so technology kept advancing. In the 2000s, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has uh, really accessible uh, data, if you want it, um, captured a million galaxies. And now in 2010, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter will have 60 million images of the lunar surface. So this is a lot of data that um, you know, we're able to take in, but we still need to process it on a human level. So how many of you are familiar with SETI at home? A lot of you. Yes. Awesome. Old school. Uh, <laughs> SETI at home, uh, so the student from the UK looked at various projects that existed already. SETI at home was one of them. Uh, SETI at home is a distributed computing sort of program, and, and it would have a uh, screensaver that would pop up whenever you wouldn't be using your computer, and it would distribute your computing power to searching for extraterrestrials. Um, at its peak, it had 5.2 million users. However, it had a lot of flaws, too. First off, there was no human interaction. So you would set this thing up, but you wouldn't really interact with the scientists behind it, and you wouldn't really interact with other people using it that much. Um, that, in addition to the fact that it just simply didn't stick scale, because how many of us are actually stepping away from our computers now anyway? So, you know, <laughs> we're not going to find the aliens anytime soon, I'm sorry to say. Um, so he also looked at other projects like Stardust at Home. Uh, Stardust at Home had 700,000 images. Um, and it essentially consisted of sending a block of aerogel, which you can see here, up into a comet. Um, and in addition to all the stuff from the comet that it caught, it also caught a lot of stardust. And they wanted to analyze what exactly it came from, what exactly all the dust pieces came from. Um, they took a more human approach. So they, uh, two scientists realized that between the two of them, they would have to mi move a microscope 1.6 million times in order to analyze all the data. It would take them the better half of their lives. So they wanted to do it faster. So they reached out to a more human community. Um, and you can actually go and analyze <laughs> uh, Stardust um, for them. Um, and so by doing that, they were able to create a human interactive community where you could interact with the scientists and the other people um, and actually uh, get this stuff analyzed on a faster schedule. So this is what Galaxy Zoo looks like today. Um, it's a fairly simple interface. Uh, you get a picture of a galaxy, and then you get about three to six uh, buttons that uh, ask you to help classify it. They also have really easy uh, tutorials written in fairly accessible language to explain how to do this if you're a bit intimidated by um, how exactly you should classify. Um, they also have a button to ask, like, do you, have, do you see anything unique or out of place? So, if you've looked at like a thousand galaxies and one looks really strange, you can also click that button. Um, they also have really uh, cool stuff for space nerds, like you can favorite galaxies so you can come back to them, other stuff like that. Um, so the key to the success of Galaxy Zoo is the fact that they don't treat their users like data monkeys. So this isn't a form of mechanical Turk. This is, they actually treat users like collaborators. Um, and so Galaxy Zoo was created by six volunteer programmers and to date has over 235,000 users, making over 120 million classifications. Um, and so a perfect example of uh, users identifying galaxies is uh, the Green Peas galaxies, which were discovered recently by users. Um, users were looking at these different images and thought that these little green dots here were really interesting looking, and they wanted to investigate them fur further. They actually discovered that these green peas galaxies are the most efficient star formation galaxies found to date. So uh, to go into how this sort of happened, the forum served as a collaboration tool. 
So people with science degrees, people with non-science degrees, were debating over what these uh, green peas were. Um, also, Galaxy Zoo doesn't just give you the image and then that's it. Um, they also allow for deep data diving. So if you're looking at a bunch of galaxies but one looks uh, interesting, you can investigate it further because it gives you free access to all of the spectrum data. Um, also, one of uh, the good things about all the human output, going back to the robots, is that it does lead to better machine learning. So it's kind of a loop function. So moving from galaxies to satellites, uh, this is a small spacecraft. This is a CubeSat. It's about a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter uh, satellite um, that a lot of people are using. And they're slowly becoming a bit more accessible um, for people to use today, slowly. Um, and this is, just to give you an idea of size, that's about how big they are. And so uh, why they're 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters is that they were built around the PC-104 board, which I've been told if you get the right one, you can run Linux off of it. Um, so essentially what CubeSats consist of are a bus, which is all the junk, and a payload, which is all the cool camera uh, measurement tools, radio measurement tools, all the uh, experimental stuff you want to strap onto it. The problem with CubeSats today is that, I said they're slowly becoming more accessible. Um, CubeSats today still cost about $50,000 to a million dollars to build USD. Um, so not that accessible just yet. Um, but there are projects like the TubeSat kit, which is being run by Inner Orbital. A TubeSat is about the same um, dimensions as a CubeSat, uh, but it, for $8,000 USD flat, you can uh, build your own TubeSat and, uh, and launch it on a rocket. Um, so that's pretty cool because you can build your own orbital experiments, uh, biology experiments, or you can do something really boring like setting up your own email server in the space. <laughs> some people are doing that. I don't know. Maybe it's exciting to some people. Uh, I think it's kind of silly. But, uh, you know, do whatever you want. Um, so for $8,000, you can do that. I have never been so tempted in my life to spend $8,000 in one go. Um, and for the environmentalists out there, don't worry. Um, most of the CubeSats and TubeSats out there are put on a two to six month sort of decay. So they burn up back into the Earth's atmosphere. So we're not creating extra orbital debris. I will say, however, that orbital debris is an area where you will probably see a lot of commercial interest and hopefully citizen science interest into how to fix that. Because this is a fairly accurate image that NASA made of some of the uh, orbital debris that exists out there today. Yes, the very large, yes, there's tons of little tiny stuff, but yes, this is the larger pieces of space junk that's out there. Um, if you're a student, there's a lot of great opportunities also. Um, so maybe you can't afford to do a CubeSat, but schools can. Um, and so a lot of schools are doing programs like SIDSAT2, um, and other universities are also sponsoring students. Um, so if you're a student, there's a lot of great programs out there, or you can simply I would urge you to ask your university if they would be up for sponsoring it, um, because then the university can say that they've gone into space, and you get to learn how to build a CubeSat and launch it without having to deal with any of the finances. So $8,000 is still a bit expensive. So if you're more in the $150 USD range, um, there's stuff like the Space Duino, which some of you have probably seen on Slashdot and other news sites. Um, it's kind of junky, but it works. Uh, essentially, a space Duino is an Arduino and a camera and a bunch of junk put into a styrofoam box and then launched up on a weather balloon to the edge of space, which is about 100 kilometers up. And you're able to take photos of the Earth's surface from space. So fairly cool. Um, this is you know, something where it's $150, so if you screw it up, it's not that big of a loss. And it kind of starts to get your feet wet into thinking about the hardware um, and other things that you have to do to get involved in space exploration. So once you take a bunch of data, there's a bunch of really cool open source visualization tools out there that you can plug that data into. Uh, one of the most notable ones is NASA Worldwind. NASA Worldwind is an open source tool that was created by NASA and some other developers, and it's still uh, maintained by a variety of developers inside and outside NASA. And what it does is that uh, it shows you the Earth's surface, and it shows you real-time or near real-time satellite data mapped over the Earth's surface. So you can look at various types of satellite data you want, 
Uh, you can look at weather patterns. There's all different ways um, that you can look into it. Um, the cool part of this is that you can build your own plugins or add-ons or whatever you have. So if you have built a space window or a satellite, um, you can take the data that you've, uh, that you've collected and then map it over the Earth's surface using NASA WorldWind. There's also uh, similar tools like Celestia, another, again, uh, open source tool, 3D visualization, pretty cool um, observation tool, uh, only it goes out to the solar system, so it's not just of Earth. So going into, uh, you know, we're collecting all this data, and so some standards are starting to emerge, what I'm calling universe-wide web standards. Um, so asterisk hacking is one of those uh, web standards that is emerging. Um, so if you're an amateur astronomer and you're taking photos of the night sky, uh, either through a telescope or however you want to, um, you can tag your photos with an aster tag, which you can see here, standardized format. Um, and then you can upload it to an astrophoto community like Flickr, whatever sort of photo sharing thing. Excuse me. Um, because you've tagged it with that data, the astrometry.net robot, a pretty cool robot that you can see here, actual size, um, <laughs> not really. Um, the astrometry.net robot is able to find that photo and come and analyze it. And what astrometry.net does is it does a, a pretty cool uh, form of geometric caching. Uh, essentially, it can look at a bunch of data points on any photo, um, invariant to scale or rotation or anything like that, and analyze that data um, and tell you exactly where in the night sky you're looking at. So this is uh, an example of what that output looks like. So this is the jellyfish nebula as taken as a photo on Flickr, and the uh, box around it is the astrometry.net robot, which has come and tagged it with exactly what you're looking at in the night sky. So the output is you essentially get organized, searchable sky information. So you're benefiting the community because you're creating a database online of all these different places of the night sky. Um, and astrometry.net, they have their code release, they have public track pages, so it's all fairly open. Um, when interviewing the astrometry.net people, uh, they said it also provides a channel for professional and amateur astronomers to collaborate. As a world coordinate system makes currently hard to access amateur imaging data interoperable with professional projects. And so this really gets, starts to get at the heart of what space hacking is all about. So, to cover off on what space hacking is all about, it's about active contribution. Being able to actively contribute to science and space exploration and push it forward. Not just being able to observe pretty pictures of NASA or the European Space Agency or, or the Japan Space Agency, being able to actively contribute to it and push science forward. Hacking into space exploration is also about open collaboration. So allowing people with a diverse set of backgrounds uh, able to actually contribute to science. So not people with science degrees, not people who you know have always been involved in science, people who just think it's really freaking cool. Um, it's also about disruptive accessibility. So disrupting the current state of science and making it accessible to everyone. And my last point, uh, it's also about opening it yourself. So if you thought some of these projects were cool, or maybe they could be cooler, um, there's so much open source data out there that no one is doing anything with. So it's not really that open. So if you Google for like NASA open source, NASA and the ESA and all these different space agencies have tons of open source stuff that no one is doing anything with. NASA actually, about 98% of everything they do is open. But they really suck at communicating, so no one really knows about it. So um, there's tons of data where if one of these projects didn't excite you, there's tons of stuff that's just waiting for a project to be built around it. So there's tons of stuff that you can do yourself. Um, and for the impatient, if you have your laptop out now, which some of you do, um, go to galaxyzoo.org. Uh, if you're impatient, you can sign up and start classifying galaxies within about co a couple minutes. It's a really easy sign up process. Um, and so it's a way to start getting involved in space exploration and contributing to science right now. So a lot of the projects I've covered off on are on a site that I created called spacehack.org. I created spacehack.org after I left NASA um, because I just, it's not really a job that you can like go to and then be like, oh, that was just a job. I don't really care about space or robots. Um, so spacehack.org has all these different projects that I've talked about. 
and a lot more. Um, it's a directory of ways to participate in space exploration. Um, and this is where you can find me on Twitter and my email address. Um, and if you have questions, I guess I have time to take questions. Uh, if there's no questions, I'm more than happy to go have tea with all of you. So thank you. Any questions? Um, go at the back, sorry. Volunteer at the back. Yes, you. You need a microphone. <laughs> Can you put your hand up again, please? We appreciate your active contribution to questions. <laughs> I thought someone else had this job. No, it's you. Um, could you just explain why the CubeSat's so expensive compared to the other types of satellites available? Uh, like, is most, that mainly the shooting it up in the air or what? It's mostly the rocket. So uh, the um, actual hardware to have a CubeSat is usually about $8,000 USD. Um, so the projects like TubeSats, uh, they're taking a fairly experimental approach where they're going to load a bunch of TubeSats onto one launch so that they can split the cost and lower the cost. So it's a fairly experimental thing that they're doing. Um, and so we'll see how successful it is. But yeah, so it's about $8,000 just to build it, but to launch it and actually make it go into space is really expensive. Any other questions? Hold on. Doesn't NASA also um, rent out space on the uh, rockets up? Don't they what? Don't they rent out space to take up CubeSats and things like that? Uh, like, right, yeah, so different rocketry are, are running these sorts of CubeSats and things, but yeah, it's still fairly uh, expensive and not very accessible to a lot of people. So that's why you're seeing a lot more space Duino sort of stuff where people are getting really impatient and saying, I want to just do this myself. Um, and people are being fairly creative with that because there's a, um, organizations like the UK High Altitude Society that's trying to figure out creative ways of um, how to really push weather balloons and other sort of balloon um, entry organism, organ, I don't know, balloon entry things um, to the edges of space to do it on a much cheaper thing. So we're kind of at the beginning of SIS and science and uh, when it comes to space exploration. So people are really trying to be creative about how they can make it more accessible. Um, and NASA, you know, to their credit, sponsor a lot of uh, open source stuff and um, other projects like that, but uh, because they, they're typically the ones with money. So. Next question is here. He's just coming. Yeah, more a bit of a, a contribution. Um, there's a CubeSat project going on here in New Zealand, KiwiSat. Uh, yes, if you have a look at I heard about it. KiwiSat.org.nz. Um, they are looking for uh, developers to help with the OS and uh, software. Um, is Bidale here? No, B Dale's uh, seeing some of the guys involved in the project uh, in the next couple of days. So, um, if you're keen to get involved, either have a look on the website and contact them that way, or see B Dale. So it's it's kiwisat.co.nz. Dot org. Dot org. Dot nz. Org dot nz. Okay. So great, another opportunity. Awesome. I should probably talk more to you guys while I'm here. I've heard it said since most of the planet's covered with uh, H2O that this should be planet water rather than planet Earth. <laughs> I, I was wondering if uh, you knew of any uh, similar efforts in other domains like medicine or oceanography. There's a lot. So um, I'm specifically more of a space geek, so I research all this, this space stuff. But I do know there's a bunch of um, uh, interesting projects around this. There's all the uh, folding at home projects, which are more with biology. Um, there are a lot more uh, projects around different areas of science. Unfortunately, I can't point you to any of them that I know off of the top of my head. I think, um, I think, hopefully I have this URL right, there's DIYbio.org, um, so for biology-related sort of similar space hacking uh, uh, philosophy stuff is on there. Um, I did buy sciencehack.org. I haven't done anything with it yet, but hopefully someday I'll get more knowledgeable in the other areas as well. Anyone else? Everyone want tea? All right. Awesome. So thank you, um, and let's go have tea.